the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegand, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heike when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heike? Thus, the village of Centerville became Heike. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Heike. Two miles west of Heike, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heike and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Grover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heike, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. and uh, provide a little bit of guidance for us as far as our rules and regulations for the evening and uh, she'll identify herself. Go right ahead please. My name is Kathy Sixel. It is March 13th and 2006 and we've had a very cool day today. It was very windy out and it's just starting to snow a little bit. Um, I want to welcome everyone for coming. It's so nice that everybody came out on this cold evening. We have a few rules. Please raise your hand when you have information to add and Mr. O'Neill will address you and move his camera so we do not miss any information you wish to share. Always state your full name. Try and use full names when referring to people. Refrain from using nicknames. And this is a hard one. Please do not visit because it picks up in the camera. So. Okay, and do we have any special guests this evening? Yes, we want to particularly welcome Reverend and Judy Koch and John Wiegand. Okay. And they will tell us about the St. John, St. Peter Church. All right. And does anybody have a card? I ran out of cards again. Okay. Okay, could we take a look at that, please? How many cards do you have made? I have 24 meat, and I've got to have more meat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would you like to just point out the church while we have the card in front of you? This is the St. John, St. Peter Church. This is the St. John Church, which was in Haika. And this is St. Peter Church, which was located near the Saxon Cemetery. Okay. Okay, and I guess for this evening, for the introduction, uh, we'd like to have everybody uh, indicate their name and where they're from, and if they have any uh, type of tradition that was passed on by their parents and so forth uh, that they had for Lenten and Easter areas. Uh, if they had something in the food, perhaps, or any kind of activity, we'd like to hear about that. Go right ahead, Kathy. My name is Kathy Sixel, and I live um, on County Trunk X. Okay. And the tradition we had, we never ate meat on Good Friday because Otherwise, the mosquitoes would bite you all year long, so it was a silly one. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Kathy. And we'll pan over here to our young lady, and she can identify herself and give us that information also. I am Irene Dine. I uh, live on Polk Lane. Okay. And I just remember on Good Friday, uh, from 12 to 3, we weren't allowed to play or anything. You just had to sit quiet. Uh, and pray or meditate. Okay, very good, thank you. And who live here, please? Selma Vogel, and uh, I was a member. I wasn't a member in the earlier days until Howard got back from the service. Okay. So uh, I hadn't spent that much time in Cleveland, but uh, enjoy the church very much. Okay, very good. And who live here, please? I'm Alice Messias. One of the things I remember, we in our family we had seven girls and one boy, oh my and goodness. his name was John, and we always called him Johnny. And uh, for Easter, my mother would always make Johnny cake. We called it. It was like a cornmeal that you eat, especially on Fridays, okay. and with syrup, and uh, it was warm with butter and syrup. And he always got. I don't think he liked Johnny cake too much because <laughs> his name was Johnny. <laughs> <That's good. it. laughs> Thank you. And we have here, please. I'm Willard Matthias, 1018 Juniper Street. Yes. And I don't remember what we ever did different on uh, during Lent. But, okay. Uh, we usually went to church on, on during the Lenten season due to the fact that my dad was always working on every Sunday. Oh, okay. We never had a chance to go to church otherwise, so then we usually had to go to church on during when the church was there on okay. Wednesday nights. Wednesday nights. Yeah. Okay, very good. And who they ever played? Melvin Yeeney. Yes, Melvin. And I remember uh, Ash Wednesday, they had church in the basement because it was 20 below. Uh oh. That? And my mother used to 
take onion skins and color Easter eggs with them. Hey, good. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. <clears throat> yes, sir? My name is Eugene Moiser, W15 County Line Road. Yes, sir. And we used to, like, in Easter morning years ago, we used to always dye eggs, too, with onions. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Ken Brunchen, Elm Street. Yes, sir. And the only thing that we always did for Easter is going to church every Wednesday. It's an automatic thing. It was an automatic, huh? Every Wednesday night was church. Very good. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Victor Schill from Glendula, Wisconsin. Yes. And I remember going to church every Wednesday and Friday and don't eat meat on Friday and okay. have an Easter dinner with the family. Okay. Very good. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? John Wiegan. 15322 South Union Road, Cleveland. Yes, sir. Uh, the only difference for us was, like previous speakers mentioned, uh, <clears throat> Wednesday night church services was pretty much automatic. Uh, it's an automatic. Okay, very good. Thank you, John. And who do you have here, please? Hello, I'm Henry Koch, retired pastor of St. John St. Peter Lutheran Church. I served there from 1969 until 1998. And we okay. enjoyed living in Cleveland very much. As for memories of Lent, my father was a pastor, so you can imagine that we were in church on Lenten services as well. <laughs> and one thing I do remember, since uh, he was a pastor, it was expected that we would know our memory work quite well. Okay. And we would prop the catechism up on the windowsill above the sink, and while we dried dishes for my mother, we had to practice reciting our pieces. Oh my gosh, very good. <laughs> because confirmation was traditionally in those days That's on right. Palm Sunday. That's right. You're right. Very good. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Judy Koch. I live in Manitowoc now. And I would just have to add the same uh, memories that most of the others was midweek Latin services. And okay. Very good. Thank you very much. And who do you have here, please? Kathy Wagner from 334 East Washington Avenue in Cleveland here. What I remember about is Lent is lots of church, 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 which didn't hurt a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it brought you around, though. Huh? It brought me around. Yeah, thank you very much, Kathy. And oh, and then in, yes. at home, yes. we had, instead of giving up stuff, we had to think of some extra things to do. Oh, really? A little yeah. extra duties and things yeah. like that? Oh. Some kindness, some kindness. Oh, things yeah. of kindness. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And okay. then we would get a star or something. <laughs> we had a chart. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Way back. <laughs> And who live here, please? Walter Chris in East Washington. Yes, sir. I can remember my mother making a big Easter dinner when the kids were small. Okay. And going to church on Good Friday. All right. Very good. And who live here, please? Go right ahead. I'm Dolores Crest, <coughs> and I remember coloring Easter eggs. Okay. And, uh, of course, we didn't believe in that funny business. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we always had chicken or something like that for Easter dinner. Okay, very good, thank you. And who do you have here, please? I'm Frederick Jacoby, and uh, I grew up in just north of Cleveland and went early years of my life to the Cleveland Church. And um, among other things, uh, on uh, Good Friday, we didn't ha have meat either, and I think that came from my mother from uh, the Iowa and Dakota relatives. Uh, okay. <laughs> noodles and prunes noodles for and prunes. noon, a noon meal on Good Friday. Uh, right after breakfast, she made egg noodles, and and uh, that was a tradition that never was missed. Okay. Plus all the services Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. And okay. Very good. Very good. And who do you here, please? Murray Pippert. Yes, Murray. I'm a lifelong Hi. member of the church. Okay. And I remember on Good Friday, the, uh, all the businesses were closed from 12 to 3. Okay. And I also, like he, to this day, m uh, dye the eggs and onion skins. Uh-huh. And we always had veal. Okay. We, ne we never had ham. We always, always had veal. veal. Mm -hmm. Wow, great. Well, thank you very much, Marie. And who do you have here, please? Dorothy Anderson. I live down in Heike, where that one of the older churches was. and. Uh, I can remember walking up to that church for Christmas program uh, practicing and uh, in the snow and everything, and that was tough to do. <laughs> <laughs> but you you made it through, okay? Yeah, I made it. Oh, good. And who do you have here, please? Charlie Bauer on Highway C in Newton, and uh, we always went to church on Wednesday nights, and uh, 
little on the side here, I'd like to thank everybody for helping me out with the Joe Nenning accident for the question of last month, and I um, just have to be part of this award-winning group. Okay. <laughs> Very good, Terry. Thank you. And who do you hear, please? I'm Edith Litzer. I live on East Washington Street in Cleveland. The one thing I know that we never ate meat on Fridays, uh, on Good Friday either. Okay. And my mother would always make noodles and prunes on that That day. too. Okay. And, and coloring the Easter eggs with, with uh, onion skins. Okay. And, uh, oh, and when on Easter morning, we'd always have to look for the Easter eggs and they'd be out in the barn around the cut feed pile. Oh my goodness. So, yes. <laughs> that was a tough hunt, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Edith. And who do you have here, please? Uh, Richard Wiegand, and I don't know what the question was. Oh, okay. I came <laughs> late. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, did your parents pass on any traditions to you pertaining to Lent or uh, Easter as far as, say, food or any special activities or anything like that? I would say they failed completely. They didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. I, myself, uh, Jerry O'Neill, the videographer. Um, there was a tradition where my mother would can cherries picked up at Sturgeon Bay or someplace, and then for the Lenten time, we'd have this cherries added to like a uh, cheese uh, pie or what he would call it, I believe. And uh, that was our traditional meal quite often throughout the Lenten season. So uh, I like that very much. And I guess we're back to Kathy, and uh, you can indicate what we're all about this evening. Go right ahead, please. I'm Kathy Sixel, and this evening we will be um, uh, having Reverend Koch and John Wiegand tell us some facts about the St. John St. Peter Church and the two old churches also. Okay. And we have lots of other people who have brought uh, lots of things along, so it okay. should be an interesting evening. All right. Well, then we will uh, start with uh, perhaps uh, Reverend Koch. Is that sure. the Okay. That I'll move right interest. over there. Thank oh, you. Okay. Okay, I've got a gentleman here, a special guest, and he'd like to introduce himself and provide some information. Go right ahead, please. Hello, I'm Henry Koch, the retired pastor of St. John St. Peter Lutheran Church in Cleveland. I was asked to bring to your attention some of the data that's available in the church records. Okay. And I was able to get access to some of the old handwritten records through the kindness of Pastor Endorf and I'm going to present that material, or at least as much of it as I've been able to accumulate till now okay. to the group this evening. Good. The first sheet I have here is a translation of the history from the 50th anniversary service bulletin of St. John's Church, and it's titled Historical Background for the Golden Jubilee of the Evangelical Lutheran St. John Congregation in Town Centerville, Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. The service folder has the usual liturgy and the hymns printed and so on. And then it goes on at the end of the booklet to give a very brief history, and that's the part I've translated for you now. Okay. The actual organization of the congregation took place in 1860. In September of that year, the first council members were elected. Mr. F. Groupy, J. Saxe, F. W. Otto, August Mill, Peter Martin, and H. Poppy. The work of building a church was begun immediately. It was dedicated 1861. The first caretaker of their souls was Pastor H. Quayle, who took up that work in 1862. When he accepted a call to Manitowoc in 1868, candidate Christian Doverdot took his place. Candidate means someone just graduated from the seminary. When Pastor Doverdot was called to Fort Atkinson in 1875, the congregation called Candidate F. Pieper as its pastor. After Pastor Pieper's call to Manitowoc in 1877, Pastor J. Hase was called by the congregation in town Centerville. Pastor Hase accepted a call to Fort Atkinson in 1883. His successor was Pastor C. Yeager, whose ministry continued until 1887 when he was called to Racine, Wisconsin. Since 1887, Pastor Philip Springling is the pastor of the congregation. A considerable list of men and women teachers have taught at the parish school, among them teachers Pouts, Egebrecht, Eiselmeyer, Ungrot, and Petzl. Forty-one members signed the Constitution accepted by the congregation in 1863, 
At present, the congregation has, ladies included, 72 members. During the 50 years of the congregation's existence, 902 persons were baptized, 625 confirmed, 298 were buried, and 164 couples were married. The count of communicants during this period is 13,316. The Jubilee Congregation's present council consists of Mr. F. Franz, J. Reinemann, K. Leonhardt, H. Jaeger, W. Jaeger, and F. Peters. May the Lord our God be well disposed to his congregation built on the right foundation, and may he establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, may he establish the work of our hands. That's a quote from Psalm 90, verse 17, and it ends with an amen. This is written by Pastor Springling. One of the pastors mentioned in the early days of the congregation is F. Peeper, so that you people know what kind of a man F. Peeper was. Here are three of his books. <coughs> this is a, a three-volume set of dogmatics. Dogmatics is the systematic, organized presentation of Christian doctrine. This is the English translation. When he left uh, Cleveland, he went to Manitowoc, and I believe from there he was called to St. Louis as a professor. His name will appear once more in the history that we come across. And now I'm going to read to you what I gleaned out of the various records that I found in the congregation's safekeeping. I commend you for your interest in the history of your community, your invitation to present information about the history of St. John St. Peter Evangelical Lutheran Church reminded me of the fringe benefits of such study. Not only are you discovering, recording, and preserving data, you also get a renewed appreciation for the efforts of the pioneers who have given us the place we live in, a place we are not embarrassed to hear described as God's country. There are still quite a few people whose memories will be able to tell you more than I can find written in the books of the congregation. I encourage you to let them record what they have. I took it as my mission to see what German words and German schrift letter style may hide for modern readers. Reading the record of that time renews our admiration for our forefathers' desire to do it right. It can't have been an easy, leisurely time in 1862, the date of the oldest extant records of pastoral acts of St. John's Church, but the writer, most likely Reverend Quayle, took time to inscribe its title page with the words, Church Book of the Evangelical Lutheran St. John Congregation in Centerville, Manitowoc County, Wisconsin, begun on the Saturday before the Third Advent Sunday, Anno Domini, 1862. The first entry is the baptism of Friederike Louise Kempf, daughter of Johann and Apollonia ne Herner, born August 9, 1862, in Centerville, and baptized in the presence of the assembled congregation on November 23, 1862, by H. Quayle. Before his name are the letters S.T.B. and after his name E.L.P which stand for Sacrae Theologiae Baccalaureus, Bachelor of Sacred Theology, and Evangelical Lutheran Pastor. Already the second baptism gives a hint of the rugged conditions of the early times. It is an emergency baptism of Johann Zeidler. He was baptized at home on December 3rd, 1862. He had been born November 15th. The first burial recorded in this book took place December 31, 1862. Louise Herman died on December 29th. She was, had been born in Vorbrücken, Germany, 1826, married in 1850. She was survived by her husband Walter and three young children. If you want further research into congregational minutes and records of pastoral acts, I'll have to ask for more time. For now, I'd like to report what the existing old indentures, contracts, and service folders tell us. The oldest document found is dated August 14, 1866. Ferdinand and Henrietta Hoon sold one-eighth of an acre of land for $10 to the German Evangelical Lutheran St. Peter Congregation, 
which was represented by trustees Gottlob Lutzi, Karl Hamann, and Henry Butcher. On January 25, 1875, Friederike Gruppe and Ferdinand Gruppe, named in that order, sold seven-tenths of an acre land to the school trustees of the Evangelical Lutheran St. Johannes congregation. They were paid two dollars. Their interest in Christian education is shown by the mention in a 75th anniversary folder of the existence of a parochial school, two summer school sessions, besides the expected Sunday school and other organizations. Music is a cherished part of church life. The 75th anniversary of St. John's founding, 1860 to 1935, reports the existence of a choir, youth choir, and orchestra. But already on June 8, 1883, the congregation contracted for the building of a church organ. John Kirk, organ builder in St. Nazian's, signed a contract with St. John trustees, John Zeitler, was he the one who received emergency baptism? The name is spelled slightly differently, but that's normal for those days. Georg Lückes, Christoph Martens, Heinrich Gauger, and Adam Freis. The organ was guaranteed for six years. The contract specified the organ after installation was to be tested by an expert of the congregation's choosing before acceptance by the trustees. The cost was to be $425 in cash, plus the old organ then in the church. $225 were to be paid when the organ was installed and passed its test, and $200 after 60 days. Found with the contract was a record of three receipts, each for $100. I don't know what happened to the missing mount. <laughs> Dated November 3rd, November 5th, and December 4th, 1883. The last two are listed as received from Reverend Yeager. I don't know the significance of that either. It's probably just he was the man to pass it along. It's interesting to see that the organ builder signs the contract in German style letters, even with an umlaut over the O, Johann Kirk. My name almost exactly except it's a K on the end. No relative. When he signed the receipts, he used English letters and wrote John Kirk, K-O-E-C-K. -E People in those days were truly bilingual and adept in using either method of communication. An organist tells me the organ was quite modest by modern standards. It had five registers of 56 pipes each, plus one pedal register and a swell for the whole manual. And yet it was quite an achievement. I'd like to have heard it. When the organ, now in use at St. John St. Peter, was dedicated as a special service was held, after the congregation sang, Oh, that I had a thousand voices, and the reading of a scripture lesson, there was a prayer of dedica and a dedication. Then uh, Professor T.W. Zuberbeer of Fond du Lac Lutheran Academy and members of the seminary male chorus gave a concert of church music. That was held January 31, 1954 and the names of the pieces as well as the composers will be familiar to all the musicians among us. I'll pass this around after a while and you can see the names of those various pieces. The dedication closed with the congregation singing Praise God from whom all blessings flow and no, I haven't forgotten the collection. It was for the organ fund. When it was time to think of building a new church, the records tell us how the two congregations proceeded. Mr. William Hoon, presiding elder, kept a personal memorandum of the meeting of the former, quotation marks, that's how he mentioned it in his own memorandum, which was added to the church minutes, uh, of St. Peter Congregation, town of Centerville, with the St. John Congregation for the purpose of building a new church and parsonage in Cleveland. Pastor Sprengling was elected as presiding elder. Mr. William Hoon was secretary of the meeting. The vote was 27-4, six against, four abstained. Three weeks from April 18, 1920, a meeting was to be held with St. John's congregation. On May 9, 1920, the fifth Sunday after Easter, as they noted it, St. John's met, 
Reverend Sprengling was presiding elder, Mr. F. Schutte, secretary. In that congregation, 23 voted for, one against, one abstained. A joint meeting was set for May 23, 1920. Pastor Springling recorded the May 23 minutes in the secretary's name. The meeting was held in Heike at St. John's Church. The, meeting, the joint meeting ratified the April 18 and May 9 decisions concerning the uniting of the both congregations. At this meeting, a constitution was adopted and the name, St. John's and St. Peter's Evangelical Lutheran Congregation in Town Centerville, Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. Two committees were formed and charged with the task of incorporating the new church and finding a proper site, quote, in or near Cleveland, close quote. William H. Tepel, F. Schutte, F. A. Jacoby, E. Klessig, W. Stoltzman, W. Hoon, and Ernst Freis will report to the congregation and then buy the site selected by the congregation. Notary Public, F. J. Saxe, recorded the decision of the two congregations to be a united religious society of the Evangelical Lutheran Synod of Wisconsin and other states already on June 30th, 1920. The name was still German. The consolidation and incorporation was recorded legally October, uh, sorry, August 30th, 1923 under the still German name. August Witte Jr., Robert Vogel, and John Reinerman signed for St. Johannes, Fred Kolb, William Stoltzman, and Ernst Klessig signed for St. Peter. When the new church was constructed, it was to cost $31,968. Edward A. Jewell, J-U-U-L, was the architect. The Verholst Company incorporated the contractor. According to the contract, the congregation wanted Armstrong battleship linoleum instead of composition flooring. And I can remember in 1969 being told, this is Armstrong battleship linoleum here. <laughs> and then red cedar shingles instead of asbestos shingles, but something changed there because, as I recall, it was asbestos when I came. If the party if the property was available to the contractor by March 15, 1922, the church was to be finished by October 15, 1922, so that the painters could get at it. There was an effort made to use local workers and local dealers for supplies, as long as the local materials and deliveries were competitive, satisfactory to the contractor, as the contract says. Aesthetics had their place, too. Only one brand of cement was to be used throughout the entire job. The church design shows refinements not often found in even in big city churches. The floor of the church slopes gently toward the altar. The pews are divided into three, not two or four sections. Even more noticeable, they are built in concentric circles from the altar rather than the usual straight lines. The acoustics are the best I personally have experienced. Though the church hall looks as though it would absorb the most powerful preaching voice, it never seems to strain the voice or have dead spots. Besides Reverend Philip Springling, William Stoltzman, William H. Tepel, Ernst Klessig, Fred A. Jacoby, Ernst Price, Fred Schutte, and William Hoon signed for the congregation on March 8, 1922. The Cleveland State Bank reported on December 1, 1928, that the mortgage on the church from August 30th, 1923 was satisfied. The German form of the name was still used, at least on the 1923 mortgage. John Lorfeld signed for the bank. Herbert Lorfeld and Clarence Whitty witnessed the signature. Land had been bought from Paul F. Yost and his wife Anna for $1,400 on May 17, 1921. On July 29, 1926, Paul and Anna Yost sold a further piece of land for $100 to the congregation. And this does not exhaust all of the records that I found available, uh, but if you need more details on that, well, I'll have to get back to you with that and consult with somebody who's able to decipher those numbers a little bit better. There was concern that the name of the congregation had not been correctly entered on the deed. It had been written as 
St. Johannes and St. Petri Congregation Incorporated, but a later legal document declared it should have been Evangelische Lutherische St. Johannes und St. Peters Gemeinde. The notary public, F.J. Saxe, duly recorded this correction July 2, 1927. It wasn't until December 10, 1952, that the name was changed at the annual meeting of the congregation to St. John, St. Peter, Evangelical Lutheran Church of Cleveland, Wisconsin. I'd like to mention one more indication of our forefathers' interest in doing it right. Travel in 1910 can't have been easy or fast. Yet, when St. John Congregation celebrated on September 18, 1910, its goldenest jubileum, it invited three of its former pastors to preach. Professor Francis Pieper came from St. Louis to preach in the morning service. Pastor Christoph Dovidat came from Oshkosh. Pastor C. Yeager came from Randolph. They both preached in the afternoon service. The Blas Corps of Dreieinigkeitsgemeinde in Sheboygan contributed its efforts in each of those services as well. Let's remember that what has been described was done out of a desire to hear God's word and to serve him. It cost them work, but it gave them also joy, or they might not have kept on doing it. May that encourage us and help us to appreciate what our forefathers have left for us. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Reverend. Okay, the question for Reverend Koch is uh, the work that you've done to give us this information this evening. How was the books kept in German, partly German, or all English? All I can show you is part of the answer. Here's the organ contract. I was oh. allowed to make a copy of it. This is in German Schrift. And it takes a little bit of reading into it to get your eye used to the hand that is writing it. Okay. There was one word there for the what the organist called the wind box, the reserv wind reservoir, that I couldn't decipher for a long time, and I had to look at uh, several dictionaries and finally figured out the German term that he was using was Windlade, which simply means wind box or something like that, wind container. Okay. And uh, But it was very interesting to see the actual contract uh, for that organ. And this is a very good hand. I've seen some of the hands in various letters and records that are not as easy to read as this. Okay. Some of them are English, especially the later ones, but it's surprising how much is still in German in the church records. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got a gentleman here who raised his hand. He'd like to identify himself and provide a question. Uh, this is John Wiegand. Uh, question to Pastor Koch. Uh, could you repeat the price for the church? The, the cost? Church? The church was thirty-one thousand nine hundred some dollars, I think. Did that include the parsonage too, or is there extra? It's a puzzle I've not been able to solve yet because I was very interested in finding a contract for or information about the building of the parsonage, and I haven't run across it yet. Okay, just one second. Okay, we got a gentleman here who uh, would like to identify himself with a question also. Well, I, I don't know if I have a definitive answer, but uh, part of that answer is that uh, the parsonage wasn't built for a few years. Okay. Uh, Pastor Sprangling continued to live down in Haika and drove up here. Uh, uh, my mother-in-law, Levina Dersch, was the first confirmation class uh, at the new church. And um, uh, now I'm losing track of years. Um, I, I think the, I think, I think until that time they had it all down there, and he continued to instruct down there because that's where he lived. Pastor Sprangling never had an automobile, okay. and um, it'd be interesting if anybody else knows the name of his horse. I just have to know interesting people, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother-in-law remembers his horse very well, too, Dolly. Okay. Dolly, okay. And he never, he never bought a car, and um, so that, that's what happened there. So let's, I, I figure it out. I suppose Levina might have been 14 years old. She was born in 1913, so maybe uh, 1927 some, or 26, something like that, was the first time they had confirmation class. They were holding the services, I think, you know, because they started in 23. But uh, the confirmation continued to be down there. Okay. And, so the, and I know the parsonage was built several years later, but I don't know how much later. Okay. 
Very good. Thank I'm you. surprised it doesn't show in the records. It may well show that yet, but I haven't found it. And <clears throat> I'm curious, too, how long did the old church building stand? And what happened to them after a while? I've never heard the story on that. And maybe John can I, tell us. I'll, I'll okay, very good. Okay, we have a gentleman here who'd like to identify himself and indicate some information. Go right ahead, please. Um, <clears throat> John Wiegand. I'm not totally sure when the building came down, but well, you mentioned 1923 was when they consolidated. Uh, Mr. Dine, who <clears throat> still lives across the road there, or a little ways to the north. Do you have his first name, please? Woodrow Dine. <clears throat> okay. he, he remembers the foundation being there, and he and his brothers, I guess, went up shooting rabbits uh, up there. <clears throat> I, I don't know if the church was there anymore then. I, I don't think it was. No. They had taken it down now. The foundation was there a long time. It was there a long time? Okay. I, <clears throat> I'm not sure what you're okay. taking away. I couldn't tell you that. But you're talking about St. Peter's Church? I'm talking about St. Peter's Church. Now, what road or location was that church, please? Uh, it's now <clears throat> referred to South Union Road. Okay. And it was just a little bit south, I believe, of the Saxon Cemetery, where, where it is right now, the Saxon okay. Cemetery. What kind of building was that? Do you recall? That was a wooden building. A wooden building? Right. Okay. Very good. I just have <clears throat> one little story about that. Sure. My family, of course, went to that church, <clears throat> St. Peter's Church, and they live South Union Road, just a little bit to the south, quarter mile or so south of there. And, okay. Um, <clears throat> they went to the my parents or my father's family, and before that they went to St. or Pleasant Hill School, which is just a little bit in north of the church. Okay. across some dines and I remember <clears throat> my father telling me this story I mean he that's before his time but I, his oldest sister Marie who was born in 1911 was coming home from the school one night and she heard some noise in the church okay and was very upset ran home told her father you know, there's something going on in the church you know thinking maybe a thief was in there or something and <clears throat> so my grand her father my grandfather Otto his name was came hurriedly up there, went in the church building, and here it was his father was doing some cleaning in the church. Uh, <laughs> yeah, old Lewis's name was okay. great, my great-grandfather. So, you know, everybody got a laugh out of that. But, okay. you know, <clears throat> those things happened too back okay. then. So. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, if you'd introduce yourself, please. Uh, Richard Wiegand. Right ahead, please. And uh, a, a number of comments. Um, Roma um, Table, Ted Table's wife, was a quail. And I interviewed her one time in Hearts Grove, and she said that I believe she was granddaughter of the of the minister that had been here in Cleveland. Granddaughter or great-granddaughter? I think granddaughter, but somebody can correct me on that. But she told me that, and I didn't even know that a quail had been had been a minister here at uh, at one of the churches. So, um, second thing is, um, I will again say how much I appreciated having uh, uh, Pastor Sprangling around for those long years that he was here. He was an excellent historian. Every time somebody died, he wrote down in the in the record in the church what town in Germany they came from. And I've used this information to go back to Germany to find some, you know, uh, ancestral locations. So I was really happy about that. <laughs> Did Mr. or Pastor Sprengling come from Germany? Uh, I don't know where he came from, actually. So somebody might know. But, uh, okay. Uh, the, the next thing is referring to the St. Peter's Church on Union Road or Saxon Road, uh, whatever it was called at the time. Uh, we used to think that the church had been located on the cemetery property where the sign is on the front. But that is not correct. The church was located, we have photos of the church. The church was located just off the edge in the field right next to the cemetery. Um, is that the on south. the south side? To, to the south, yeah. Okay. And the cemetery was actually never a part of the church. It was an independent cemetery, I think, from day one. And it was originally called um, God's Little Acre before it was called Saxon Cemetery. And I don't know when they changed the name, but John and I were looking in the records and we came up with this uh, with this information. 
Um, my dad, Lewis, said that when he was born in 1921, when, when he walked to school, and he would have started in, to the Pleasant Hill School, he would have started in 27, the foundation was still there at that time, but the church wasn't there anymore. But the foundation, uh, like somebody said, was there for apparently quite a long time. Um, there was a shed, which I'm not sure if it was across the road, um, but that became the, half of that became the garage at the parsonage at the St. John St. Peter Church. I'm not sure when it was moved that was torn down to build a new garage just a few years ago. Uh, half of that building came to the church here in Cleveland and the other half went to uh, Jacoby's and they used it as an outbuilding of some kind. And that half is gone too now. Mm -hmm. And I think from what Woodrow Dine said that the shed was across the road and there was also an orchard or there were some trees across the road on the west side from the church. But I was always assuming that there was something built on the cemetery in that area in the front where there aren't any stones because people would say there's a foundation under there, there's concrete stones or something. So I'm not sure what was located, if there was another building located there or if it was a horse parking lot or something, I'm not sure what was located on the front part of the, the St. Peter or the Saxon Cemetery, I should say. So mm -hmm. uh, those are my comments. Okay, thank you. We got a gentleman here who will identify himself, please. Melvin Yenich, and this foundation was, I don't know if it was for the church or what, some other building, but it's just beyond where the flagpole is now, because I know they, the stones were sticking out yet okay. when, uh, when I was a kid. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, we got a gentleman here who would like to identify himself. Right ahead, please. I'm Fred Jacoby. Uh, the, I, I have some information about uh, what uh, they did with the buildings uh, in Heika, St. John's. Uh, there was a separate school building there. Now, Richard is talking about one to Jacoby Farm, and so I think maybe... It was not yours, it was the other... Jacobi. Bud's. Yeah. Bud's place got some building there. Could I have the first name of Bud, please? Well, I'll tell you what, I've been thinking about that all day. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you say Albert, nobody's going to know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a fact, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, so Bud got a building from uh, St. Okay. Peter's, apparently. Thank you. Uh, well, his Fred. That's where Fred's farm was. But Fred was the f on the report here. That was Bud's father. Okay. My uncle. All right. And, but um, the um, there was a school building down on the next to the church in Heika, St. John's. Okay. And when they merged the two congregations, when they joined, my father bought that, my father Roland Jacoby bought that school building, and then it was moved to our farm over two winters. Uh, I don't know why they didn't get it done the first year. I mean, I, 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 I think I, somebody said once the weather got so bad, they got it as far as Pagos. They put it on a couple of big farm sleds. The building was maybe uh, 20 by 30, something like that. It was our woodshed, which meant it was full of stuff. And uh, that was there until just uh, about two years ago. And I think, is it David Hansen that owns that? Does anybody know for yeah, sure? Yeah, I think so. And, and uh, they tore down all the buildings okay. there and so on. But it was there. And, and we had pictures for it at the Town Centerville um, 150th mm -hmm. anniversary okay. and the history of it. All right. Uh, so that was that one. Now, besides that, I've got some information from letters. Uh, my father happened to have been uh, a young bachelor in, uh, when this was all going on, and somehow he got out to relatives in the southwest, uh, no, 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 northwest corner of Iowa and um, was working at relatives' farms there for a year or two, I still haven't been able to establish uh, that exactly. Uh, during that time, there was a wedding, and my mother came down from Dakota, and he met her, and so then there are letters. And uh, while I know that my mother did destroy a lot of letters, about 175 to 200 survived. And uh, in those letters are letters that have paragraphs about the church being developed, the new church. Okay. Uh, 
the first letter is written by um, my father's mother, and and it's written on his birthday, July second, um, in nineteen twenty one, and uh, then this is I, I wrote it out here because she, it, her writing is sometimes hard to read, and then my father sent that letter along to my mother to be and scribbled in between so it's really hard to read <laughs> and uh, but I, I deciphered it and so on July 2nd she wrote 1921 and that fits right in with the dates that you had there pastor she says well they hauled sand for the church and digging out the sewer and put in some tile after a while when people have more time the architect will stake off the grounds and in fall, we'll dig out the basement and start early in the spring with the main building. Then, there are three, there are three excerpts here. Uh, that was July 21. The next one is March, um, March 27th, 1922. And my father's brother, Fred, uh, writes him a letter in Iowa and says, well, the church contract now Oh, yes. The church contract is now let, and the bricks are selected and bought. The first car should be here any day. Verholtz Brothers of Sheboygan has the contract for $32,000. Phillips has the contract for the well and has started already. A nice place for him, as it's not far from town, and I think he means I meet him between the job and Cleveland most every trip I make. Okay, so he's talking about that, and that is the same as Pastor had about the contract. Then, July 2nd again, on my father's birthday in 22, his mother writes him another letter. Let me see, I gotta get this straight. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did I read three already? <laughs> Let me see. First 21, then the brother. This is the one. Oh no. Sorry. I'm gonna call. Okay, we got a gentleman that is reading some letters from his uh, past families. All right. Um, and then she writes after she, the letter is started, and she says, well, um, instead, I will write a letter as it's Sunday, and this afternoon the cornerstone will be laid for the new church, and we'll all go. Carl Tapel will be the speaker. I think there will be a mob of people there. That's, that's all that's related to the church. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, we got a gentleman who will identify himself, please. Go right ahead. Uh, Richard Wiegand. Um, the Wiegand family did not belong to St. Peter's Church until I think around 1881. We're not sure, but um, my dad said that they joined St. Peter's when Louis P. Wiegand got married to Agnes Lutzi. The Lutzis were members of that church. The Wiegands, all of the original Wiegands that were born in the, in the States, the first generation, uh, were baptized and confirmed in St. Mark's or the whatever the church was before St. Mark's in Mosul. So they trudged four or five miles in the other direction to go to church for 30 years or something. Could you give us a highway or something there? Well, it's Dairyland Drive now, and uh, I don't know, is it what's... It used to be 141. Yeah, it used to be 141. And what's the crossroad? Before that, is it uh, Orchard. Orchard Road? Okay. It's 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 in Town Mosul and it's it's towards Sheboygan. That's all uh, right. All the old, the original Wigan records are in that church. Okay. So uh, I think it was when when Louis P got married to Agnes Lutzi is when they decided to join the St Peter Church, even though it was just down the road. You know, I mean, it was mm. handy enough. You know. Okay. Uh, the other thing is. Um, uh, Carl Tapel, I want a, some clarification as to which Carl Tapel that is, that he was talking about that was 
was going to preach at the church. At okay. The Thank you. Okay, we got a gentleman here who has been presented a question, and he'd like to see if he can provide an answer. Go right ahead, please. Go right ahead. Okay. I'm Fred Jacoby. Uh, as to uh, Richard's question about Carl Tapel, it just says Carl Tapel, so I can't provide any more other information. Uh, it might also, I, I was going to mention before when I was reading those excerpts, uh, the letters are postmarked Timothy, which came up here in an earlier meeting. One time I think Charlie brought it up. It was what Newton used to be called. Correct. And the postage was two cents. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Very two good. Cents, huh? Thank you. Okay, we've got a gentleman here who uh, has some information. He'd like to identify himself, please. I'm John Wiegand. Uh, the, the Carl Tapel previously referred to is he's buried up on Saxon Cemetery. He was born in 80, 1881 and died in 1969. I can just vaguely remember him. I mean, I didn't know him personally. He either preached or at least spoke at our centennial in 1960. Uh, he was already retired at that time. And I remember his daughter bringing him up to the cemetery up by us and probably six, early 69 or whatever, and he, he died that year, but I remember him, you know, walking around up there yet. I don't know exactly where he lived the end of his life, but he, he is a son of the congregation. He's a brother to one of the tables that lived down here, uh, a, a William Table, not, not the one previously referred to, a different William Table. I don't remember what, what the father's name was, but uh, he, he's from this area, and he, he did come back here numerous times to preach, although he, he was not ever a pastor at this church, okay. I think. Very good. Okay, we've got a gentleman here who has uh, perhaps an answer. Go right ahead and identify yourself, please. Richard Wiegand. Um, uh, there is a Carl Tapel who's retired uh, um, principal or whatever from uh, the Lutheran high school in Sheboygan, and he's the son of Ted Tapel, the one that I mentioned, so he would be a descendant of yeah. Pastor Quayle. Um, the, uh, the other Tapel, William R. Tapel, I think is the one that John was talking about, and the brother would have been the Pastor Carl Tapel. There was another Tapel from around that time period, or maybe a son, who got a master's degree and became the legislative historian in Madison. And I found a record in the State Historical Society, and he was from our area. He was a descendant of the what we call the Centerville Table uh, group with William and Carl and, and uh, Ted Table and those. Uh, okay. So I found that information uh, when I was in Madison. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, we have a lady here who would like to identify herself, please. My name is Kathy Sixel, and I was wondering, Agnes Lutzi, is did she come out of the house barn, uh, Edith, by any chance, from that family? I was trying to think about that, too. I don't know for sure. Okay, Richard knows. <laughs> okay, here we go. Right ahead, please. Uh, Richard Wiegand, uh, Agnes Lutzi was born in the house barn in 1858. Okay, and the Agnes uh, Lutzi that you're referring to, Kathy, is in what way uh, I've... Uh, um, who did she marry? We talked about oh, that. Uh, Agnes. Okay. Richard Wiegand. Uh, yes, Agnes sir. married my great grandfather, Louis P. Wiegand, okay. in 1881. Okay. And the day after they got married, they got like 10 feet of snow. It, ra it snowed for like two days or three days, and they had to tunnel to get to the barn, and uh, the snow was above the trees or you know higher than the apple trees is what the description was. Wow. Thank you. Okay, I got a young lady here who would like to uh, identify herself and provide some information on a special uh, uh, description. Go right ahead, please. Okay, I'm Marie Pippert. But first, I want to explain you talked about Carl Tapel. Yes. I know that they're buried up there. He was a minister uh, up at Algoma too. When I, uh, my mother came from up there, and when we went up there, went to his church when we were there on a Sunday. And he was uh, the minister at St. Paul's in Algoma. And I remember when uh, the daughter, what was her name in now? I can't remember the daughter, but she's buried up there too. And uh, that's the first time I ever saw a casket being opened up at a cemetery. They opened it up there that all our relation, all the Lutz's, Reinmonds, Wiegand, and all of those 
a relation could view her and uh, she was real yellow. She had yellow jaundice or something like that. You don't remember that? Uh, of course, I don't remember when that was, but uh, <laughs> I remember looking at her. And I've never seen that before, that they opened up a casket at the cemetery. Mm. Okay, the the place. Yeah. okay, we've got something special here that uh, I guess Ma a, Marie has, and she'll explain it all. Go right ahead. Go right ahead, please. I don't know, it says something on the back. In 1860, the Congregation of St. John, St. Lutheran Church of Heike had its beginning. June 14th, Town of Sunderville was organized the church. For 60 years, the two congregations separated by a distance of about three miles was always served by the same pastor. On Pentecost Sunday, May 23rd, 1920, a decision was reached to merge the two congregations to build a new church building in Cleveland. The dedication of the church was June 25th, 1923. The cost was approximately $40,000. Okay. Now, could you point out the churches that are shown here, please? This one is uh, 19, uh, 1923. And that's what As church? old as I am, I don't remember... The only one I remember is the Centerville Church. I remember going down there Christmas Eve for a Christmas party, a Christmas program, and I remember we went down there with a sled, but I don't remember whose horses or anything it was, but that's the only thing I remember that. I don't remember this one at all. Okay, and that's, uh, do they indicate that is St. John over there? Yeah, this one is St. John. And the location where it was uh that one uh, that is was down at Heike. In Heike? And okay. this is the one that was uh, up there at... Okay. Union and this is, the, yeah, this is the, the new one now. All right. Looks pretty much the same yet. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Now, that was a special plate. That what was, is that? Uh, yeah. That must have been... If that, no, 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 how many years was that, I wonder? This 85? The 125. Well, 125, yeah. you think it was? They had a big yeah, service yeah. and then a dinner at the Bill Mar, was that? Right. Yeah, we yeah, had big doings at that time. Okay. Very good. Okay, uh, we have a lady here who would like to identify herself, please. I'm Edith Woodsey, and I was just wondering, we talking about when the church was built in Cleveland now, and they still, a lot of people came with horses, I imagine. Was there ever a horse barn down in Cleveland? Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. okay. But where was that located? Okay. Thank you very much. We'll have somebody answer that question. Okay, we had a question on the floor, and uh, this gentleman raised his hand. We'll identify himself, please. Uh, I'm Fred Jacoby. Uh, somebody's asking about uh, putting up horses at the Cleveland Church, the New Cleveland Church. Well, it was uh, the north end was the garage and faced the parsonage, and there was a long building there. Okay. And how the building changed over the years, I don't know. And I don't remember horses being, but I know that they put their horses up in that barn, uh, I suppose, especially when the weather was bad. And then there was a part of it that was made into a concession stand immediately behind the garage that may have all been changed by the time you were there, perhaps. Huh? The concession stand was still there. It was. And uh, so that, I know they, they put their horses, to, you know, people okay. have talked about putting mm -hmm. their horses up there. All right. Thank you. Very good. Okay, we got a lady here who would like to say a few words and identify herself, please. Dorothy Anderson. I just wanted to say that Pastor Sprangling served the congregation for 46 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. Imagine that. Did he One confirm you too? Huh? Were you confirmed by him too? No. Oh. Okay. I couldn't understand German. I got confirmed in Sheboygan. Oh. Okay, Marie, you said something about you were confirmed. Uh, mm -hmm. Right ahead, please. Okay, I'm Marie Pippard. I was confirmed by uh, Reverend Springling. And what year was that place? Oh, uh, <laughs> 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 must be 1928. Okay, very good. We were 20 in the class, I remember that. And this was at the new church already? And he was very lenient. If you didn't know your, your stuff, he'd pat you on the shoulder. Okay. If you didn't know it. If you didn't know it, uh-huh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time ago. Okay. And again, you said what year was that? Again, 1928? I think 1928. And that would be the new church. But, but uh, I don't remember. Did uh, Reverend Brown come after him? Yeah. yeah. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Because uh, Reverend Brown married us. Okay, that's he, good. Yeah, and he uh, was, uh, the first one that he had a berry was my little niece. She was four and a half years old. That was very hard for him. And uh, 
He had to bury her, I remember that. Okay, very good. From the book here? Yes, go right ahead. Dorothy Anderson, Reverend Sprangling resigned in 1933 because of ill health, ending a ministry of 46 years, and then Rep. Pastor Brown was installed in November of 1933. Okay. And then on September 22, 1935, the congregation celebrated a double anniversary. 75 years had passed since the organization of the congregation, 15 years had passed since the merger of the original two congregations. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we got a young lady here. Say, like to say a few words and identify herself, please. Go right ahead. I'm Irene Nine, and I would like to know where that church in Haika was, and how long was it there, or how was it disposed of, or bought, or sold, or. Very good. Thank you. Go right ahead, please, and identify yourself. Melvin Yeni, and I believe that parsonage is still standing from that church. Yeah. I don't know exactly which house it is, but yeah. it's a nice it, brick one. Okay, we have some questions pertaining to the parsonage at the church, which would be what? St. John's Church? Yeah. Okay, and you're going to answer some other questions, please. I'm going to ask one. You're going to ask one. Okay, go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Irene Dein. Uh, well, first, my question still stands where it was, but the parsonage for the Lutheran Church is the la last house on Beach Street. Uh, because the mission ha Mrs. Haunstein used to live there, and they told me that Reverend Springling at one time lived in that house. Okay, and that's in Haika? In Haika. And Beach Street, and is it on a corner someplace? It's on the very end, okay. to the north. Okay, all right. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, we have a question on the floor pertaining to the location of a church. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Dorothy Anderson. It would be the first road west of the Haika Bay Tavern, and you go north in there. Okay. And then a, a little bit further around. But on the corner there was the Catholic Church, and then you would go around the Catholic Church into the Lutheran Church. Okay, the Catholic Church that was there was what name, please? St. George. St. George. George, huh? Yeah. Okay. But you go down what street again? Uh, Lincoln. Lincoln? Yeah. No, it's beach. 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 Oh, I mean, yeah, you'd be going on the Lincoln, and then you turn. Turn on the beach. On the beach north. Okay. And it would be back in. There. Okay. Which side of the road was it on? West. 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 West facing east. Front of the church faced east. Right next to uh, south. Mrs. Taylor lived in the house yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Would it be south of the house? Would it have been south yeah, of the I think the, so how, how the church was north yet. Right oh. down to the river, huh? Oh, yeah, it's pretty close to the river. My question to you, Dorothy, is there a cemetery at that church also? Um. Sure. Sure. Just across that road, to the east, there's a cemetery. Yeah, west. That's right. You don't get there from there. You have to go <laughs> okay. another block west. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a lady that raised her hand. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Kathy Sixel, and I think when we did the walk down in Ahaika, it, it was way at the end of the street, and there's real huge cedar trees. And those were the original cedar trees that went with that church in. Does that sound familiar to the rest of you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay, and now that cemetery, I'm going back on that cemetery, the location, mm -hmm. and is it affiliated with other cemeteries? or yeah, how is it? Mm -hmm. Can somebody answer that? I can probably answer that. She okay. can answer that. Okay, I'll go over here. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have a young lady who'd like to answer a couple of questions. Go right ahead, please. Well, I'm Irene Dine. That cemetery is for both Catholic and Lutheran, and they're all one, and it is west of the church. Okay. All by itself. All by itself, okay. Very good, thank you. Okay, we got a gentleman raised his hand. He's got something to offer. Go right ahead, please. Yeah, Richard Wiegand. Uh, when we did the, uh, the street walk in Haika, we went back in there on Beach Street, and then we were we walked up that driveway. I don't know who lives there. There's a house back in there that's on the east side of the cemetery. And we figured out that the church might have been in there somewhere, maybe the back side of the church toward the cemetery and the front side looking east toward the lake. But, but we weren't sure. And we don't have a photograph of that church. At least we've been looking around. This is the first a uh, photograph that I've seen of that church. We have Saint, we have photographs of St. Peter's, but we don't have a photograph of St. Johannes. 
So it's well, it's on the plate, but uh, you know, a regular. Some words, there needs to be a original photo of that church. Well, there there has to be. Pastor, did you ever see it in the church? Okay, we got a question on the floor pertaining to photographs of churches uh, that combined. Go right ahead, please. Uh, Pastor Koch, I I remember seeing the Golden Jubilee booklet, which has pictures of the old church. Where that original picture is, I don't know that I've ever seen that. But the anniversary booklet has a picture of the church, and, and I think it's the same picture as is on the on Ray Pippert's plate. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, we have a gentleman here who'd like to say a few words. Go right ahead. Uh, Richard Wigan. There's there's a, a table descendant in Algoma, and I can't remember his first name. He came uh, to visit us about a year or two ago. He gave us a call, and they end up calling me. Um, and he came down, and I took him around. Um, and I believe he's a parochial school teacher. He's about 30 years old. Uh, he's from Algoma, and he's probably a descendant of that uh, uh, Carl Tapo. But I, I don't remember what he said. But okay. I took him around and showed him everything I could think of about Tapos in the area. So. Okay, thank you. Okay. You got a gentleman who will identify himself? I'm Fred Jacoby. I have a few items from the um, 1960 uh, centennial celebration. Uh, one is a, a booklet that is lots of pictures and all names of people, Sunday school, church council, everything in that booklet. Uh, here is a service booklet from that same time. And then here is an invitation to the services. I don't know who they sent it to, but it's an invitation. Could you read that invitation? Well, uh, cordially invite you to attend the centennial celebration of St. John, St. Peter Evangelical Lutheran Church, Cleveland, Wisconsin, Sunday, September 11th, 1960. There were four services. The first one was at 8.30, was uh, called an English centennial service, and the speaker was Reverend Martin Brown. 10 o'clock uh, was a German centennial, and by the way, the one of these booklets, oh, this one, has the Germans all written out there, and uh, the speaker was Reverend W. Reinemann. And then at 2.30, there was a confirmation reunion service, and the speaker was Reverend E. Tapel, and that's a question for Richard. Okay. This E. Tapel, I, I, I don't know who this is. Emil. And then at uh, 8 p.m. in the evening was another service uh, referred to as Church at Large, and the speaker was uh, Reverend Eldon Bodie. Okay. And I brought fry at 4.30. Okay. So what, we what could pass these things around. Hmm? What year was that? Nine, this, is the, this is the 100th anniversary. We you, can pass these things around. You refer to some invitation that was written in German by chance? Did no, I the service. Th that there was a German service, and so... Okay, could, uh, if you can't read it, could Mr. Uh, oh, Reverend Koch read that for us? I might be happy to do that. <laughs> Pastor Koch. Yes, sir. I've just been challenged to read the whole German service <laughs> <laughs> for an anniversary, and now that they've asked, they're going to sit and listen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I won't do the whole thing, but it begins with, now thank we all our God, then the, a liturgy. Uh, the second hymn is, Oh, That I Had a Thousand Voices. Okay. And then the uh, festival sermon by Pastor W. Reinemann from Hartford, Wisconsin. Uh, abide, with, abide Among Us With Thy Grace is the sermon, the hymn after the sermon. And they close with prayer and blessing and a rather brief service otherwise. Mm -hmm. Was that written in German, that particular? Everything here is in English letters, but in German language. Okay, could you just uh, pick out something that you could uh, give us a little German uh, excerpt, please? Nun danket alle Gott mit Herzen, Mund und Händen, der große Dinge tut an uns und allen Enden, der uns von Mutterleib und Kindesbeinen an und zählig viel zu gut und noch jetzt und Getan. First stanza. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Forgot what the Pastor, question uh, <laughs> High Pastor and low Co German. All right. You're low German. Is, now, can you give us something on that area? High German is a derivative of the language that Luther happens to have chosen when he translated the Bible into the German language. And he picked the language which was prevalent in the area where he was a professor, which was Wittenberg, Germany. That particular language developed into what we call High German. 
Otherwise, Low German means just that it was the dialect spoken in the lowland part of Germany, okay. the flatlands to the north. Okay. Highland is, or High German is simply in a higher elevation part of Germany, has nothing to do with innate quality. Okay. Uh, low German is like the many dialects that we used to have in our country here, but even more differentiated than we're used to. When you speak of lowland versus highland, could you give us some villages or cities that are in those particular areas in Germany? Well, Hanover is now considered the center of high German. Okay. Lowland Germany will be Bremen and Hamburg. Right. But what the dialects are there, I can't tell you anything about it. I never learned low, low German. Okay. In my father's family, we only spoke high German. Okay. When I was a student and went back to Germany, I was taken as a guest uh, to a farm in northern Germany. There was a pastoral conference being held there, and my host pastor and I, we were quartered in one of the farms there where they spoke low German. That is, the older generation did, the grandparents. Okay. They didn't know any high German. I couldn't understand them via German, and I knew German well, but I understood a little bit of what they said via English because Low German was so close to Anglo-Saxon that I learned, I understood more via the English than the German. Okay. Now, the cemetery that we refer to for St. Peter's Church is from Saxon. Now, where is that located in the areas of Germany? Center and north. Center and north, okay. And close to some uh, city we would recognize? I'd have to look at a map. I can't I think that fast. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, one more question. Uh, when you were our pastor, uh, how many German services were required at that time at your start of, the, of your pastoral service here? My father saw to it that I maintained German all during my school years. We would speak German in the house and he would scold us if we lapsed into English. I was trained to be a preacher of German. Every congregation I was called to had discontinued German just before I came because they couldn't get anybody who could preach German. Okay. And that's been my fate ever since. <laughs> the only time I preached in German was on festival occasions. I'd be asked someplace to go to a mission festival. They needed a German speaker. Okay. And everybody ducked out on that, so Koch knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, thank you. By the way, uh, your wife, I didn't get a chance to talk to her. Do you speak any German? No, I, I don't speak German. I learned it as a child. When I first learned to speak as a small, you know, preschooler, Okay. Um, I mostly learned German. But unfortunately, um, when I went to school, you know, I just spoke English and my parents didn't sure. keep it up with me. I can understand that. But what I understand it quite well. Oh, okay. And what school were you uh, going to school at when you were required to learn German? Uh, no, I never learned German oh, in school. Oh, you never school. did? Oh, okay. Okay. No. All right. No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to have your name, please. Go right ahead. Dolores Kress. My uh, <clears throat> mother, she spoke, I guess, high German. My dad spoke low German. Okay, okay. <laughs> so we had, as kids, we had that all mixed up. But it was the funniest thing. My oldest son, Erlen Jr., my, he, my dad always talked German to him, and he always answered him in English. And to this day yet, I couldn't figure that out. Okay. That he ever remembered that. <laughs> yes, yes, that's very unusual. Yeah. So he could understand it, but he couldn't, couldn't speak, speak it. Couldn't speak it, no. Okay, very good. Thank you. And that was the and John and Nancy. They just didn't catch on to the German. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Because Vernon never talked German, mm -hmm. and neither did I at home. We never talked German. That is unusual. Thank but, you. Uh, but she could understand Grandpa. <laughs> just couldn't believe it. <laughs> Thank you. So a young lady here would like to identify herself and go right ahead, please. I'm Marie Pippert. Talked about the Low German. From my mother's side, that was all Low German. I love to hear that. 
I could understand it, but I can't talk much, just a couple of words. <clears throat> and then another thing I wanted to say, mm -hmm. when uh, I remember when I was young, we had quite a few German Russians in church, and the women would always wear shawls. And the women s uh, sat on the left side, and the men sat on the right side in church. They never used to sit together. That was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I had to go to German school for six weeks, not like the kids now go for one week, a half a day. And we had to walk up to the cemetery, you know, where, okay, where the Pleasant Hill School is. That's where we had, I had to walk two and a half miles. Oh, really? For, and and uh, that was six weeks. All day. We had to go for six all weeks. All day. Yeah, all day. All day. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, the gentleman had his hand up. He's uh, like to identify himself. Uh, Richard Wiegand. Um, I have a lot of thoughts. The temples from Algoma, that fellow told me that he had discovered in his research in Germany that there was one branch or there was one part of the family that was blue blood. They were royalty or something like that. I don't know what. And, and I had always assumed that we were all peasants, you know. But but there must there was some some royalty or something, and I don't know what they call their princes or their, their royal lines in Germany. But he said one of those temples was, uh, and this is from the Centerville temples, was what he thought was a blue blood. They had okay. they had some status. Okay. Um, the the Saxony, and I think there's a couple of Saxonies. There's an upper and a lower, or there's a Saxon Anhalt, and there's a Saxon something. The Saxony that. Saxon Road that the community that uh, on Union Road comes from is above Czechoslovakia over in the south, what I'd call the southeast, it's not real south, but it's over on the eastern side and it was part of East Germany uh, when the countries were separated. Okay. And uh, I've been in that area and um, one of my ancestors was from near Dresden and others are between Dresden and Leipzig. And there's another city called Chemnitz, and then I think there's a city called Halle. Halle. It's right on the border of Saxony when you're coming in from, uh, from the west. So I've been in that area, and I know the Lutzis, the Tables, the, the um, uh, Huns, Yeniks, uh, you know, up and down the road. Not Wiegand. Wiegand was from Detmold in the northwest part, and he might have been a low, low German speaker. Uh, Wiegand came you know, separately, and he married into the Saxons, and the story always was that Wiegand spoke funny. Uh, the, the, you know, the old people would tell me that he didn't speak very good German or that he spoke funny. Well, he was from a totally different part of Germany. Uh, so uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was, um, I think in 1960, that uh, memorial, or that, uh, what was it, the 100th anniversary, day, that Sunday. I don't remember if I sat through three or four services that day, but I know that I went to some of them, and I went to the German one, and uh, it's, I, I have been to a church service in Germany, but I, this was, I think, the last time that I'd been to a German church service in the States, and it maybe was, I, I don't remember if, if we ever went to any before that, um, but in 1960 I was uh, 12 years old. Uh, Reverend Bodhi did used to have German services, uh, and before that, all the ministers had German services before that, and when Reverend Karras came, he didn't speak German, and that was the end of it. And I don't know whether you had a chance to, to do any services in German or whether anybody cared, but, but I know we had German services up to 1959 in the church, with the exception, I think, of the World War II years when I think they stopped for, you know, the period during the war, but there mm -hmm. were regular German church services in the in the St. John St. Peter congregation. At least, you know, when everybody started speaking English, the, mm -hmm. there was German up to 1959, okay. from what I know. So, All right. so I can be corrected on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got a gentleman here who would like to identify himself, please. Go right ahead. I'm Willard Matthias. Uh, Marie brought up about going six weeks to summer school. Well, I, I, I don't know. I must have been one of the lucky ones. I, I went six weeks up at Pleasant Hill, and I went two years down at um, the, the Bussies, or uh, Brookshins place. And I have a picture here from us fellows that went to the school down there. 
Okay. And I'll show you that. If you can. Oh, Would my God. To take up, pick him up. Yeah. Can you, yeah, could you identify the people? Sure, I can. Uh, this is uh, Pegalo, Wallace Pegalo, well, Wally uh, Ertl, Eugene Dostler, Willard Mathias, um, uh, 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 Tavern down in High Gasset. Strotman, Marvin Strotman, and Kenneth Schutte. Okay. We were the only ones that had a bicycle. Oh. So we <laughs> took our bicycles to school. Okay. And this is a noon hour. A noon hour, okay. Then we had a fire going already, you know, the fellas. And here's Marvin Strotman and Dossler. And I think this is Vernon Gruby. Okay. And Ertl and Schutte, myself. And that's uh, Zill. Um, okay. Cat, not Richard. Adrian. Adrian Zill. And Pigolo, he always, he always had the shirt out. I'm going to ask you to go back over that again, and I uh, want the full names. Oh, okay, and I did give them to you. On That's here, okay, I'll take it here, too. Yeah, okay. okay. Marvin Strotman. Okay. Eugene Dostler. Thank you. Uh, Gruby, uh, I think there's Vernon Gruby. Yes, sir. Uh, Wally Ertl. Okay. Kenneth Schutte. Yes. Myself, Lord Mathias. Yes, sir. And uh, Zill, uh, Adrian Zill. Eugene Deasing and Piglo, Wallace Piglo. Okay, and do you remember your teacher? That, that was a teacher uh, we, uh, up at uh, Pleasant Hill. We had a Wigan girl. Uh, she married a guy from Howard's Grove. Okay, we'll hold for a moment, see if we can get some help. Okay, uh, Mr. Matthias is trying to recall his teacher's name, and he's Come up with it. Go right ahead, please. Anita Wiegand was my teacher up there. Okay. And then when I went down to the uh, school down there by Brookshins, the first year we had an elderly preacher that came out. And the last year we had a young student. That's where we could have the fire. Okay. <laughs> 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 okay. But uh, he, he'd come with his old car, a real old car he had, and he was our teacher. He lives here in a uh, village by somebody. Okay. But uh, I said I was blessed with three years of going to summer school. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We got a little young lady who'd like to present a question, I believe. Um, my, Kathy Sixel, I want to know how come there were so many German schools? And why did some of you go one way and some of you go the other way? But nobody seems to have gone to that little one at Haika. It was gone. It was, oh, was gone the by then. Okay. went down there. Okay, we got a young lady here who will identify herself and uh, answer maybe a question or two. Go right ahead, please. I'm Marie Pippert. I remember I went to German school at uh, Pleasant Hill for six weeks, and, and that's where this church was. Okay. And I remember the teacher was Johanna Brockman. Johanna that, that I remember. <laughs> and then I have to tell you a quick story about yes. Reverend Brown. Uh, we were in church one Sunday, church was full, and my oldest son was three years old, and all of a sudden Reverend Brown got a little hot under the collar, and he pounded up on the pulpit, and here the kid pipes up, boy, about him getting mad now. Oh, good. <laughs> I felt like two cents, and I remember Helen Wheeler, Helen Hahn, sitting behind me, laughing her head off, and after she had seven or eight kids. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Very good, Marie. I'll good memory. That. Thank you. <laughs> but you had something also to add. Go right ahead, please. Well, um, a couple things. The German language in church. My older sister, Anita, was confirmed in 1937, and I always understood from her um, that that was the last class confirmed in German. Okay. Up until that time. And then the German services, I didn't realize they went to 59. I thought they ended in the early 50s. So the but pastor at that time would have been? In 37? Yes. Well, that probably was Pastor Brown, huh? Yeah, I think so. And then the school, the, the school by Bussies, that was just a half a mile from us. And... Um, uh, what uh, road or where are we? Well, it'll be County Trunk X now. Oh, X and Center, cool, we huh? live on, our farm was in the corner of X and Centerville Road. And it was just a half a mile west, and I don't know the name of that road. Well, it was right where the highway is. Right? Yeah, right. That's where the highway is now, right. And um, now I was thinking when Willard was talking about the boys there, now, of course, 
if you have about a dozen or 15 big 7th and 8th grade boys, they probably wouldn't do anything wrong, right? But the, the lady teachers boarded all summer at our house. It was handy. And you think about how supervision is so strict today because otherwise there'd be a lawsuit, you know, fear of lawsuit. Um, the teachers used to walk home with my older sisters and the shooty girls at 12 o'clock. My mother would have lunch for them, and then they'd go back to be back at school at 1. In the meantime, of course, like I said, you would never have done anything wrong, right, Willard? <laughs> These children were all unsupervised. Maybe 40 kids there, huh? Whoa. No lawsuits that I ever heard of. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> but there were lots of bees. There were no screens. There were no screens, no screen door on that building. And it was surrounded by lilacs. I remember the bees. <laughs> and they called it German school. I was probably one of the last yeah. ones to take German. <laughs> this was this was like the the old the old way of teaching the the teacher and the student on different ends of the log. Pastor Brown on the other side of the table and me. I was the only one. Why? All my friends talk German fluently. Oh, really? And it didn't take with me either. <laughs> I, I never did learn to speak German okay. <laughs> fluently. I, I, I can understand a lot because I was with my father a lot, mm -hmm. and my parents talk German. Okay, thank you. Okay, we got something uh, recall here. Uh, Fred Jacoby. Yes. This is a list of uh, all the confirmation classes. I have this because uh, my father-in-law, uh, Vernon Dersch, worked this up for the 1960 anniversary. And I don't know if that was used later again, but I imagine there's an updated version. And his job was to get all current addresses of uh, surviving confirmants. Okay. And so all the classes are listed here, and, and uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Okay. In the family, we use it for reference I'm quite sure. often. Yeah, very good. So anyone's welcome to look at it, too. It belongs to Levina Dirish. Okay, thank you. Okay, we got a young lady here who has uh, raised her hand, and she'd like to indicate something. Go right ahead, please. I'm sure that a lot of you will remember, unless it was mentioned before, about the bake oven bread that people oh, baked yeah. years ago mm -hmm. when Reverend Grip Brown was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ziegler still have this brick oven or whatever it is. And uh, they baked this, this bread outside. Uh, in this special oven, and the people would be, oh, they just uh, fight to get the <laughs> loaf of that bread. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, was this uh, a portable oven that they brought to the church, or no, how did no. it? They no, they have it at their homes. Oh. Uh huh. It, it's sort of a brick oven, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they put coals in to right to heat, heat it, it, and then they take the hot coals out. Yeah. And we'll put the bread in. Sure. And they were the round, round, round like big round Did loaves. Did Ziegler bring that to church? Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I think you remember that, uh, I don't know, somebody auctioned it off or something. Oh. But they sold it. They sold it, huh? Uh -huh. Grandma Lucy always made bread for that, too. Okay, uh, you were is indicating, you re uh, recall that type of thing also? Yes, um, Edith Lutzi, and I know my mother-in-law baked bread for this bazaar many, many years and that was a big doing, so I don't know how many different batches of bread she always made. And when I was first married, I used to bake bread out in that kind of an oven, too. Really? But okay. uh, afterwards, it just seemed to be too much work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was, and it was a hot job, too. You had to, when you had to scrape all those coals out to the front, mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and then they would drop down to the bottom. It was a very hot job. Okay, very uh, good. Edith, who Thank was you. your mother-in-law? Emma. Emma, let's see. <laughs> yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, we got a lady here who raised her hand. She'd like to identify herself, please. Marie Pippert, they call that Buck of Brot. Those say that one more time. Buck of Brot. Buck of Brot. They bake oven bread. Okay. The round bread, they always had bazaars. Boy, they used to get a lot of people at the bazaars. Okay. And they had they had played bingo and they had beautiful prizes. Okay. Yeah. And... Uh, they always had a lot of a lot of people there. Another thing I want to talk about, I remember the old organ. My uncle Oscar Lutze would pump that organ, and kind of Mary Lutze played the organ and and sang at the same time. 
Okay. And load. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And what years was that? Oh, I don't know. That's a long, long time before they got before they, before they got that new organ. But I can see him pumping that organ yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, uh, Reverend. As far as uh, your schooling, and uh, I understand you went back to Germany to do some additional schooling. Uh, how was that conducted? Was uh, it pretty rigid as far as your education? I don't know really how you understand rigid. My father said, you're going to be a minister, and I'm a minister. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't regret it one bit. Okay. It, it was one of the smartest things I did in my life. <laughs> now, you started here in the United States to go to the start the schooling? When my father was pastor in Berlin, Germany, I was a little boy. Okay. And at the time, the Nazis were becoming very prominent. In fact, once when I was shown the window of a person who belonged to the Nazi party, and I pointed out to that house, they, they hushed me up and said, don't, don't say anything, because they were afraid of getting into trouble because, well, things were getting risky. Mm -hmm. And I'm told, I didn't notice it myself, that there were Nazi party members in party dress, sitting in the back rows of church, listening to my father's sermons, because really? he was known to be an American citizen, mm -hmm. and if he dared say anything political, that would have been very bad. When it was time for me to go to school, he resigned and came back to the States so that I could begin schooling here in this country. Okay. My sisters are younger, and they would then also begin schooling here. All right. So all of my schooling was here in the United States until I finished seminary. And then I went to Germany for two years. Okay. Studied at the at a German seminary for one year and at Heidelberg University for one year. Okay, very good. Now uh, another question in regard to when you first came to St. John St. Peter's, uh, what changes took place from the first days you joined us until the day of your retirement to the structure or whatever? <laughs> I, I, I'd have to stop and think. But actually, I, I consider the time in Cleveland to be a very calm, quiet, and very well-organized time in our life. As far as major changes in the church, we of course noticed that there were more and more young people moving into the cities, so we lost membership as a result. Mm -hmm. But the congregation still kept up a, a very great interest in maintaining its church property. And a beautiful addition was put on the church, one that uh, the congregation can take real pride in. Uh, it was a time when people were putting a lot of entrances in front of churches to make them handicapped accessible. Mm -hmm. And I find very few that match the artistic and aesthetic integrity of the one that your church has here in Cleveland. It is a, a real masterpiece of joining a new piece of uh, architecture to the original design. It, it really matches without any kind of a, a break in, in line. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, I guess a personal question also. Your duties as of uh, this day or uh, these days since you retired, what have you done at that time? Since retirement, every so often I'm asked to serve at congregations that have difficulty in getting another pastor. They may have a vacancy for a time, and it's difficult for them to hold services at the usual hour, so they ask retired pastors to come and serve them for a few months. And okay. I was able to help out in a few places like Long Island and Morrison, my father's old congregation, and okay. uh, near Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, Richmond, Virginia, and uh, Oklahoma. Oklahoma City. Okay. Um, and then some other kind of work uh, down in Florida also. All right. When did you retire from New Cleveland? 1998. Okay. My wife reviewed that date for me. <laughs> <laughs> and when did you come? 1969. That one somehow sticks with me. I don't know why, but it does. And I think you were here for 29 years? Yes. Okay. So uh, were you and Pastor Springling one of the lengthier uh, 
Uh, yeah, well, Pastor Brown was quite long too, although okay. Pastor Springling is the longest. I'm yeah. Sure. All right. I've got a question in regard to the Lutheran Church and the religion part of it. At one time, we were into what they call the Missouri Synod. It was St. Peter and St. John's, were they the Missouri Synod? And then did the, they combine and become something else? They were always Wisconsin Synod, you remember? Oh, yeah, okay. The, the history repeated for us tonight, it told that one pastor always served the two congregations. And very early on already, they had joined what was then called the the Evangelical Lutheran Synod of Wisconsin and other states. Mm -hmm. The other states would be like Minnesota and Michigan, which once were also synods, but they were joined together into the Wisconsin Synod, which was for that time in the early days in fellowship with the Missouri Synod, which was a synod of Missouri and other states. Okay. That fellowship, unfortunately, broke apart and we aren't in fellowship now. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you very much. Go right ahead, sir. I Matthias. I remember the day when Reverend came to Cleveland. I think I was one of the first ones to meet him because I had to bring the check up there to the church to pay for his uh, trip, for his uh, moving. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was $750, something like that, for the, the moving. Of the, I just happened to be uh, taken over and when it's in November as the new treasurer of the church at that time. Okay. So then uh, I had to see that the bills were paid. And we hit, were in the midst of remodeling the church. I'm in the parsonage yet. And we had put, I think we put in all new carpeting and we were still at the bathroom when you moved in right, at that time. That I remember that too. Okay. So was, we did a lot of this stuff ourselves that time. In our, um, fellows okay. but uh, I it was tre treasurer at that time for three years and uh, then I'd been on many years on the finance committee i am just off of it now for two years now but um, I know when I got done with being the treasurer of the church then I handed the books over to Kenny Group uh, Kenny uh, Brookchen. Brookchen, yeah. And uh, so then he could go. I had the books. I got them from uh, um, Bobby Priggy that time. Okay. And when we, when we first started out being the treasurer, it's 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 so funny if you think about it. When we get done counting the money, we had a whole table full of change and a few dollars. Okay. No checks. All change. And I remember we had these envelopes. We had two partitions in them and a man and a wife each got their own envelopes so then uh, I seen some other churches they were do having one envelope so I had it finally got it changed at our church that one per family none of this two per family mm. so uh, to reap the harvest Kenny was the first one to get them the, with the big envelopes which was a lot better but you have no idea of how many pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters and stuff you had <laughs> when you opened up these uh, envelopes at that time. I remember one a couple, one lady, she'd put 15 pennies in each one of those slots. <laughs> so then, you, I mean, it was a lot of work. And now that I'm off, just before I, I uh, retired from that job, now, it's all checks or big money. Okay. There's nothing like uh, even hardly, sometimes I used to open up uh, for 50 people and I'd only get maybe $5 in singles. The rest is all fives, tens, and twenties or checks. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, it's so much easier now to count this money than it was when we first started back in 60. Well, I started already on that job on, I think in 1966 or something like that. Okay. So uh, I, I said, I, I handled an awful lot of change. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, very good, very good. Go right ahead, please. And Marie Pippert, we also had a lot of plays that we had uh, down in the church basement. I was in them for years and years, and uh, they had them for two nights in a row, standing room only. Okay. And we always had a lot of fun. 
and I was in the church choir, I think, for as long as I can remember, in, in a quartet with Howard Vogel and uh, Roma and Albert Jacoby okay. and I, and that's only once in my lifetime I played the organ and sang Silent Night at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> One time. <laughs> One time. <laughs> Very good, Marie. Thank you. Okay, we have a gentleman who would like to uh, provide some information. Go right ahead, please. I'm Fred Jacoby, and Marie just brought up the plays, which went on for many years. And uh, today I made a quick look through some pictures that I had. And we used to take big ones, you know. <laughs> and um, this is probably like um, 47, 48. Okay. 47, in fact. I can. Um, and I'll, I'll pass them around. As you, you'll know some of these people. Uh, there's Violet Peglo, Elaine Schutte, Eunice Schutte, Laverne Leideritz, Wallace Peglo, Adrian Zill, and myself. And um, then the other picture of the play, you'll, you know, there's Earl Groupie, Warren Hines, uh, Marlene Koenig, uh, one of the uh, Gertigo twins, Doris Stellman, uh, Jeanette Larson, mm. and um, uh, the Geeky girl, uh, Eleanor, Eleanor mm. Geeky. And these pictures were, t this was taken apparently during a play. Okay, can I have a little uh, <laughs> shot of those? Or got to hold it steady for just a few moments, please. After doing, I don't know. So I've obviously posed. Okay, thank you. And, and these were taken the day after when we were cleaning up. And so some of the people that are here weren't actually. Okay, this is the cleanup crew. Yeah, and then there, I have other pictures where the people on the pictures are, are even from the St. Wendell Church. Okay. They just were friends and they were helping us and so on. All right. So we'll just pass them around so you'll recognize some people. Okay. But it was a lot of fun and kept the kids busy. And there wasn't quite that much to do in those days. Mm -hmm. and, uh, okay, thank you. But it was fun. Okay, we got a young lady. Would you like to say a word? Uh, Kathy Sixel, and I would like to know how many people here were um, belonged to the church their whole lifetime. Okay. The because whole... I came later. I first joined the church in 1958. Okay, thank you. Baptized there? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Go right ahead, please. I think I was uh, baptized in the house at home. Was, uh, must have been Springling at that time. Okay. And uh, I, uh, Can you guess at the year that it happened? Your age would probably give us a shot at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see. Uh, I must have been one year, one and a half years old before I was baptized. Okay. All right. Very good. But I did go to summer school. I did have to go to the Sunday school, and, uh, and then they had to go every Saturday to really learn the Bible. Okay. So I think some of it rubbed off. So Good. Yes. <laughs> Good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. A gentleman here who also went to St. John, St. Peter's. Go right ahead. Uh, I was baptized sometime, but what my nickname is Buddy, and that came about when Dr. Reiner delivered me. He tickled me on his chin and said, hi, buddy, and that stuck. That stuck. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, when I was going to school, somebody, uh, I guess it was Billy Hoon, called and asked for Melvin, and my mother said, Melvin who? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you. <laughs> right ahead, sir. Ken Brookshin. I've been a member of the church all my life. Day I was born. Okay. Long could, that. could you tell uh, us that day, please? 1938. Okay, very good. Thank and you. And one of the real things that I remember from way back, and I think that may have been before you came, we used to take Christmas trees, and they always tell, people donated Christmas trees for Christmas. They always were great big ones with big trunks, and they'd whittle them down. And this one Christmas, I think Alfred Lutze was a janitor yet. And Christmas Eve, had the nice tree up there. That morning before New Year's Eve, before New Year's Day service, came, the pastor came into church and says, oh my goodness, here the Christmas tree fell over across all the benches on the west side, and it was laying across the top. And they asked the people from the church council to come in with chainsaws yet then, and needless to say, that tree got sawed up real quick <laughs> on New Year's Day before the church service that morning. 
good. Since then, the tree gets wired up. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. Thank you. Very good, Ken. Thank you. Could you identify yourself, please? John Wiegand, also a lifetime member of St. John, St. Peter. Okay. And what did, when did that happen? Uh, <clears throat> began in 1950. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Ed, please. Dolores Press. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you did you uh, belong to the church when you got married or anything like that? Uh, let's see, when I came to Cleveland, that was after Vernon got out of the service, and that was in 1940. When was this the war over? 45. 45? 45. 45. <laughs> okay, so you were a member at that time then? Yeah. Okay, very good. And I guess I'll just keep right on rolling with the camera. Who is, uh, you can identify yourself, please. I'm Fred Jacoby, and uh, our family was, uh, uh, were members of the church, and I grew up there until we left town and I went out to school and that. Okay. So, but we, I was baptized, confirmed, married. And what year was that again, please? What year for? When you were baptized? Probably 1931. Okay. And uh, confirmed in 45 and married in 58. and. Then our first two boys were baptized in the Cleveland Church. Very good. Thank you. And uh, you're a member of St. John St. Peter's? Yes. And a lifelong. And what time? And I must have been baptized because I have the Taufschein at home. <laughs> and my name well, is... Well, well, what was that word? Taufschein. What is that? Baptism uh, booklet. Of, you know, oh. Word that, uh, okay. That's in. And my, <clears throat> my name is really Maria Dorotea. <laughs> Maria Dorotea. That's how I was baptized. Okay. <laughs> I wish they would have left it. I like Maria. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Marie. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Yep. <laughs> and who is her place? Dorothy Anderson, and I belonged to the church in Cleveland until I went away to school, and then I was married and lived elsewhere. Okay. But my name, like hers, was on my baptism, Dorothea Otilia. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. <Mill. laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Join our came to this. I mean, just let's see. And I just came to this church through a marriage since 1938. 1938. And, okay. Uh, yes. And then they were talking about I belong to Trinity in in, Cle in uh, Liberty, mm -hmm. and they were talking about going to. Uh, religious schools for six weeks. I had to go two full years, mm -hmm. and I was confirmed in German. <laughs> really? Okay. Okay. And the pastor at that time was? Pastor Hensel in All in Liberty. Liberty. Okay. Thank you. I'll just throw my last words in there. I uh, was originally baptized in uh, St. Earth, Liberty Church, rather. Mm -hmm. And then we transferred from Liberty to St. John, St. Peter, and that would be about 1952. And uh, there's a little recall, which is kind of embarrassing for me, and that is my parents told me that uh, the Sunday school always had to give a nickel for mm -hmm. change to the box. And I looked in, or put my hand in my pocket at the time the uh, basket was coming, or coming by, and I only had a quarter. Well, I had a big decision to make. So I threw the quarter in, and I saw there was a few nickels, and I took them back. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one embarrassing one. <laughs> and I guess, Kathy, we're pretty much at the end of our evening, and uh, perhaps you can sign us off a little bit and thank okay. a few people. I want to thank, uh, thank Reverend and Judy and also John for coming, and it was a very informative. Thank you so much. You did your homework very well. And um, we will meet next month, and it will be April 10th, and I don't know what room yet, and I think we're going to try to get Carl and um, Margaret Stockmeyer because there was one more church that was in Centerville, and that was near um, Packer Inn. So we want to see if we can, you know, get the history on that church. And then, do uh, you know of any other churches that we would have forgotten? What is the church that used to be right by the river church? Yeah, that was a Reformed church. Yeah, and, the John. and that we did um, a couple years ago, huh, Jerry? Yeah. Charlie? Yeah. Roy Lipke came and he gave us the history of that. So, okay, well, okay. thank everybody again for coming, particularly on such a cold night. <laughs> okay, I guess. Next month? It's going to be uh, the church that was near Packer Inn. Oh. <coughs>
The first rooster church. The first rooster church, right. Well, we're going to sign off uh, with just names only and just to sign off on the uh, tape here. Go right ahead, please. Kathy Sixel. Thank you, Kathy. I'm going to pan over here and keep it going. And who do they here, please? Irene Dine. Thank you, Irene. Selma Vogel. Thank you, Thelma. Alice Mathias. Thank you, Alice. Willard Mathias. Thank you, Willard. Melvin Yaney. Melvin, thank you. Eugene Weiser. Eugene, thanks a lot. Ken Brookshin. Thank you, Ken. And you, sir? John Wiegand. Thank you, John. And you, sir? Victor Schill. Thank you, Victor. And you, sir? Pastor Cole. Thank you, Pastor, for all your help. Very well done. Judy you, Koch. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it very much. Kathy Wagner. Thank you, Kathy. Walter Welcome. Chris. Thank you, Walter. Dolores Chris. Thank you, Dolores. Fred Jacoby. Fred, thank you. Marie Pippert. Marie, thank you as always. Dorothy Anderson. Dorothy, thank you as always also. Charlie Bauer. Charlie, thank you. Edith Lutze. Edith, thank you very much. <laughs> and I guess uh, one final sign-off by Kathy. Thank you. We had a good evening. Very good. And, and Jerry. Okay, thank you.